Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 Solutions for Congested Corridors program workshop. I see people are still trickling in, so we're going to give everyone a couple of minutes to get started. Um, if you're looking for the right place, then this is the right place. Okay, so the time is now 102. Again, good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 Solutions for Congested Corridors program workshop. You will hear us refer to the program interchangeably as program and SCCP through the course of this workshop. As a reminder, anytime we state we or us, we are referring to commission staff. Welcome. I am Naveen Habib. I manage this program and I am joined by Matthew Yaska, Deputy Director of SB1 Programming to cover today's workshop. We also have additional members of our team joining us today to help moderate this workshop. This includes Kayla Giese, Celeste Aceves, and Cherry Zamora. In these workshops, we plan to review and amend program guidelines to prepare for the next program cycle. These guidelines govern how the program will be implemented, facilitated, and reported on, as well as how funds will be distributed to reimburse agencies for expenditures. Before we get started, I will share a quick refresher about the program. Kayla, if we can move to the next slide. Established in 2017's landmark Senate Bill 1, the SCCP provides funding to regional transportation planning agencies, county transportation commissions, and Caltrans to reduce congestion throughout the state. Since then, $250 million are appropriated annually from the state highway account to accomplish the mission of this program. The program is currently on its second cycle, covering fiscal years 2021-22 to 2022-23, with seven projects programmed for $500 million in funding and total project costs valued at $2.6 billion. And with that, let's move on to some housekeeping items. Kayla, please walk us through the GoToWebinar logistics. Thanks, Naveen. Sorry, can you hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CCP workshop. Our workshops normally take place in different locations around the state. However, containment measures surrounding, surrounding COVID-19 have required us to adjust to webinar format. Please bear with us should we encounter any technical challenges. The workshop agenda is located under the handouts tab and can be downloaded and saved during the webinar. It can also be found on the commission's website. For participants joining us through GoToWebinar, please find the webinar panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. There you will find the audio question and handout tabs. Under the audio tab, you have the choice to listen in via the computer or telephone option. If you prefer computer audio, please select the appropriate box. If you prefer the phone call option, select the corresponding box and dial the phone number, access code, and audio pin as directed by the automated system. Please note that if the audio pin is not entered, you will remain in listen-only mode and will be unable to speak should you have a comment. As a reminder, each registered attendee is provided a unique link and phone number to access the webinar. These cannot be shared with other participants as they are registered to a specific attendee. We welcome comments and questions from attendees as a part of each topic at this workshop. 
There will also be an opportunity for comments and questions at the end of the presentation. There are two options for the participants to provide comments. You may click on the hand icon to indicate you wish to make your comment. You will then be unmuted and called upon to make that comment. Please be sure to state your name and affiliation prior to voicing your remarks. Also, please use the raise hand feature as early on into a topic as you can to give the system time to acknowledge you. You may also use the questions tab to submit a question or comment. Please type in the topic you are commenting on and your comment. Commission staff will read the comment on your behalf. You will not be able to be on camera while making comments. That's it, Naveen, for me, back to you. Thank you, Kayla. If you have joined us previously, you may be aware that agendas are posted up to 10 calendar days in advance of each workshop. If we could move to the next slide, Kayla. Presentations and recordings are posted after each workshop. We will email any key decisions made during a workshop to all attendees following that workshop. We will make recommendations based on the consensus reached throughout roughly two workshops. For timeliness, additional time on any topic may be limited to ensure all scheduled topics are covered during the allotted time for any given workshop. Similarly, previously covered topics may not be readdressed at subsequent workshops unless determined necessary. Finally, a reminder to all attendees, if you plan to make a comment or ask a question, please clearly state your name and your organization's name before making your comment. We have a lot of people in attendance today and it will just help everybody keep track. You may raise your hand or add a comment at any point during our presentation and we will ensure all comments are addressed as received. I will also add that if you have a comment about something that we've already discussed and you want us to go back a slide, uh, we're more than happy to do that. And we, you can also conversely wait until the end of the workshop to revisit um, parts that we've already covered too, however you feel comfortable. Alrighty, so moving on to the next slide. In our previous workshops, which took place on September 28th and October 29th, respectively, uh, we covered several different items. If we can move to the next slide, I would like to go over what some of those topics were that we covered. So these are lessons learned from the previous two program cycles, the proposed program schedule for cycle three, an overview of proposed technical changes to draft guidelines, funding restrictions, and the timeframe and funding for the upcoming cycle. In the next two slides, I will share high-level discussion highlights on pending proposals that we plan to discuss further in our 2022 workshops. If we can move on to the next slide. One of these outstanding proposals was the requirement that the California Environmental Quality Act and the National Environmental Policy Act clearance be achieved before program adoption. Uh, both of those are shortly known as CEQA and NEPA, of course. Based on the feedback we received on this proposal, the early consensus, it seems, is to stay the course with the existing requirements. Some of our commenters have expressed that changes may limit different projects from competing for funding. As this recommendation has sparked a robust conversation, we plan to revisit this proposal for an immersive discussion in our 2022 workshops. However, that slide has some information there if you missed any of our previous workshops, so I do um, encourage you to review it at your leisure. The next slide was the second proposal to determine the length of the next program cycle. Since its inception, SCCP has programmed two funding cycles. The first cycle covered four years of programming with $1 billion in SCCP funds and included fiscal years from 2017-18 to 2020-21. The current cycle is the second cycle, which covers two years of programming with $500 million in SCCP funds and includes fiscal years 2021 to 22 and 2022 to 23. For this upcoming third cycle, we recommended a two-year program period, but highlighted additional program options for discussion purposes. Based on the feedback we received on this proposal, early consensus indicates support for the two and four-year program cycles, which may allow the SCCP program cycles to sync with other commission programs. The main concern about a longer program cycle was that it may preclude competition and project diversity, um, there was also a suggestion to consider hybrid funding cycles like the Active Transportation Program, also known as ATP. The main concern here was that the funding split and overlapping cycles may reduce the total amount available for allocation in those years. 
Like I mentioned, uh, we will be covering both the CEQA NEPA issue and the cycle three and funding issue in workshops uh, that will be coming up in 2022. So now in the next three slides, I will cover proposals where we reached a consensus during our previous workshops. If we can advance to the next slide, please. This includes incorporating CAPTI strategy 1.2, which promotes innovative, sustainable transportation solutions in the program by requiring that all projects be a part of a multimodal corridor plan, also known as CMCP, consistent with the Commission's comprehensive multimodal corridor plan guidelines, as adopted by the Commission in December 2018. This resulting change will remove the reference to existing plans, updated plans, hybrid plans, and new plans from the SCCP guidelines in cycle three. We understand that there may be some nuances to what this means for specific types of new plans, and we will work with any agency on those nuances accordingly. Next slide is the change under eligible projects in the 2020 SCCP guidelines. We will add clarifying language to factor in performance optimization measures of SCCP funded equipment without requiring additional justification. The optimization phase may be part of a singular or separate contract from design and build for post implementation optimization. This critical period helps to ensure the installed equipment is functioning as intended and to make any necessary adjustments, thereby protecting the investment longer term. This change will also allow increased consideration of technology-based and or technology-inclusive projects to future-proof SCCP-funded projects and project segments. So in the next slide, for your viewing convenience, we have provided the current and proposed language in the same place. If you will notice, the proposed language is going to be in yellow font, just so, or golden font, depending on your screen. Um, just for your convenience so you can see what exactly we're proposing to add and what we will be adding at this point. So this concludes the recap of the last two workshops. At this time, I will pause to see if there are any questions or comments before we dive into agenda review. Kayla, do you have, do you see any questions or commenters? Hi, Naveen, no written questions uh, right now and no hands raised. Sounds good, thanks Kayla. Um, okay. So in today's workshop, we will focus on evaluation criteria, specifically efficient land use. Josh Rosa from the California Department of Housing and Community Development will join us to lead the discussion for this section. We will also discuss CAPTI Strategy 1.1, which will serve as a conclusion to our discussion from October's workshop. And lastly, we will address office hours, 2022 workshops, and key topics for subsequent workshops. As Kayla mentioned earlier, in the navigational bar on the right in GoToWebinar, under handouts, you will see the reference documents that we will be going over and probably consulting throughout the course of this workshop at this point. You can also find these documents on the workshop webpage on the Commission's website or also on the SCCP page on the Commission's website. Reference documents here include the workshop agenda, 2022 SCCP guidelines, the CAPTI action plan, and the supplement A discussion draft. Um, if we have no questions or comments, I think we can move on to the first item on the agenda. As I mentioned earlier, today we are discussing efficient land use, which is a secondary evaluation criteria. Uh, on the next slide, you will notice that for reference, this is section 16.2 on page 10 of the 2020 SECP guidelines. As I mentioned earlier, Commission staff has been working with the California Department of Housing and Community Development to propose a better integration of pro-housing related principles into this program's efficient land use evaluation criteria. And now I would like to introduce Josh Rosa from the California Department of Housing and Community Development, also known as HCD, to get our discussion started. Josh, over to you. Hey, Naveen. Um, I'm not Josh. I'm Matthew Yazgat, the Deputy Director for SBO and Programming. Uh, I look a little bit like him. Uh, Josh is having some severe technical difficulties. We have been trying to keep him logged in, and I believe he is currently logged out. So in order to make the best use of our time, um, why don't we proceed along through the agenda uh, in an attempt to allow Josh to get securely logged in and then 
Um, we can come back to the housing, the pro housing uh, presentation if, if we're able to get them back. And of course, uh, as we're always um, willing to navigate through uh, technical difficulties, if we're unable to secure Josh uh, on today's workshop, we will bring him back to uh, the, the subsequent workshop. Sounds good, Matthew. So, um, Kayla, if we can skip ahead to slide 29, that's going to be Capti Strategy 1.1. I can provide a quick recap about that strategy, or actually, um, since we have Matthew on here already, why don't we go ahead and have Matthew provide a short recap since he covered this so expertly in our last workshop. And uh, we'll come back to Pro Housing, hopefully if Josh is, um, connection improves at a later time in the workshop. Sorry, Naveen, this is Kayla, bear with me. There we go, that should be the right slide. <laughs> no, absolutely, you did great, thanks, Kayla. <laughs> no, thank, thank you very much, Naveen, and thank you, uh, audience members, for bearing with us. Uh, as we move move around and play some musical chairs with our agenda today. Uh, so before we um, kind of dig into the conclusion, um, of Capi Strategy 1.1. I wanted to provide a short recap um, from the October workshop about the Capti Strategy 1.1 and how it will be addressed in this program. So for reference, this strategy can be found on page 22 of the published Capti. Uh, we've also placed it on the PowerPoint slide in front of you. So to reframe the Capti Strategy uh, 1.1, this is to prioritize congested corridors projects that enable travelers to opt out of congestion. This strategy states that through um, the commission's public guidelines development process, we staff will work towards updating solutions for congested corridor program guidelines uh, and scoring criteria to better prioritize projects that provide travelers with options to opt out of congestion. These innovative sustainable transportation solutions should focus on reducing vehicle miles traveled and could include investments in bus and rail transit, active transportation, and highway solutions that improve transit travel times and reliability, uh, such as price managed lanes with transit service, dedicated transit lanes, and tra transit signal priority, or that generate revenue for vehicle miles traveled, reducing projects through employing vehicle demand management strategies. Uh, Kayla, we can move on to the next slide, please. So during the October workshop, I presented three separate options, A, B, and C, to initiate the discussion to incorporate this strategy into solutions for congested corridor guidelines. We did not have any preference. Uh, we as in the staff did not have any preference um, on any of the options that were presented. The wording for options A and B were pulled directly from section 16.1, on page nine of this 2020 Solutions for Congested Corridor Program Guidelines. Uh, and since this CAPTI strategy outlines changes on how solutions to congestion are defined, I felt that this was the most applicable section of guidelines to propose these options. Uh, both options A and B added the words uh, reduce or um, in front of uh, minimize VMT in the solutions portion. So in summary, Option A was derived directly from the CAPTI strategy, and the language was added as a sub-bullet under the second paragraph highlighted in this slide. Option B differed slightly in that it included an abbreviated version of the CAPTI strategy, and the language was added in a sentence at the end of the second paragraph highlighted in this slide. And option C would have added a bullet, uh, a new bullet, to the evaluation criteria requiring applicants to describe how their projects expected benefits were supported by local land use policies. This option was a bit more out of the box, but did pose an intersection between CAPTI strategies 1.1 and 7.1. Uh, the thinking here was that housing and land use focused policies can also be those which are meant to encourage travelers to opt out of congestion and in turn lead to reductions in vehicle miles traveled. Uh, Kayla, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So based on the feedback that we received, both during um, the October workshop, as well as uh, we were, did receive some comments by email following the workshop and um, by phone call, uh, consensus indicated uh, support for option A. Therefore, we developed a consensus, this consensus-driven proposal entitled Supplement A, Discussion Draft, 
uh, which is the proposed language um, change, which can be seen on this slide. Uh, it's also on the Commission's website, and you can access this supplement A uh, from the navigational bar on the right side of the GoToWebinar um, tool. The proposed changes can be seen in bold yellow font on this slide. I will not read the entire uh, paragraph, but as, you'll, as you will note, the changes here include the addition of the words reduce or um, before minimize vehicle miles travel, and we've also added if so, how, uh, so that applicants can specify and further expand on their methodology on reducing vehicle miles traveled. Finally, the inclusion of the language derived uh, from the CAPTI strategy is included as a sub bullet. The language about vehicle miles reducing projects being to uh, better prioritize here is not intended to provide those types of projects with an increased evaluated credit, but rather it is meant to demonstrate that should projects compete equally through all of the evaluation criteria and arrive at the same or similar rating, the project that is deemed to reduce vehicle miles traveled in line with this strategy would be prioritized for funding. Um, so with that said, uh, I'm going to close, close my, um, presentation of, uh, kind of, uh, the, the conclusion around CAPTI strategy 1.1, but I will now turn it over to, um, Are we going back to prayer housing? Yes, I believe we are, because we've got Josh Rosa on the line. Okay. Hey, Josh. Bear with me, Josh. I'm getting back to the beginning of your presentation. <laughs> can, uh, can other people see me? Yes, we can all yes, see you. So I, I will say, we now that we have Josh, um, we can, I'll ask our attendees to think about uh, the CAPTI language that we presented and we can revisit any comments that um, attendees want to make on that following Josh's presentation. So Josh, I'll, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you. And I'm so happy to be here because <laughs> for some reason we had a lot of difficulty joining, but here we are. Um, uh, good afternoon, this is Josh Rosa from the Department of Housing and Community Development. And I wanna thank the commission staff for allowing us the opportunity to share some potential concepts for cycle three uh, in SECP. These concepts really utilize two new opportunities. First is CAPDI, which we've heard a lot about. And the second is HCD's Pro Housing Program, which is really uh, the, the majority of, of the presentation that I'll give today. And then i um, really happy to help with any questions or, or comments that folks might have about that presentation. Um, next slide, please. So uh, first and most importantly, uh, these concepts build on a history of previous collaborations with the Transportation Commission and HCD. In the last cycle, our department worked collaboratively with the commission and with stakeholders to create guidance and indicators for how applications could demonstrate efficient land use. Efficient land use is one of the statutorily required co-benefits in SECP. So in the last cycle, we worked together to develop specific indicators for this co-benefit. And ultimately the 2020 SECP guidelines incorporated by reference a supplement that listed and described eight indicators of efficient land use using types of local policies that support housing and technical assistance. Ultimately, projects generally scored favorably on this efficient land use co-benefit in the 2020 cycle. In particular, applications indicated a high level of coordination with city and county planning departments. Next slide, please. Um, but we also observed challenges. Because the guidelines required applicants to independently substantiate the local policies they were citing, each narrative was highly particular. 
based on the applicant's independent interpretation of how certain local policies were meeting the goals set by the land use efficiency supplement. So for cycle three, we're exploring opportunities to provide standards and guidance that are clearer and more consistent. And we also wanna broaden the potential options that local communities have to demonstrate efficient land use. HCD's recently launched Pro Housing Designation Program could help meet this need using a uniform certification process to evaluate local policies. The Pro Housing Program also provides formal verification of local communities um, and local policies that creates benefits under multiple state funding programs, not limited to SECP, but also other funding programs. And finally, the Pro Housing Program dedicates staff to providing ongoing technical assistance and collaboration so that local communities can access the support they need when they're ready to use it, whenever that might be. Um, next slide, please. So uh, first, before we dive into that Pro Housing discussion, I also want to note how today's initial concepts can help implement CAPDI Strategy 7. As folks in this workshop know, CAPDI addresses SECP in several strategies. Today, I'm only addressing Strategy 7 in particular. CAPDI's Strategy 7 seeks to reduce VMT by incentivizing infill housing and densities that are feasible for each community, building on the Pro Housing Program and housing elements. This applies to seven particular transportation programs, which includes SECP. So we're working closely with the Transportation Commission to see how we can achieve this. Um, next slide, please. So to help us achieve that CAPTI goal, as well as SCCP's statutory requirement for efficient land use, we suggest utilizing the Pro Housing Program. Pro housing defines the types of local policies that advance state priorities for housing, transportation, location efficiency, climate change, health, and equity. And the pro housing program creates incentives for cities and counties to adopt these policies. Upon request by any local government, HCD will evaluate and verify the local government's policies meeting these pro housing criteria using an objective and uniform process in light of transparent and defined goals. The local governments that meet pro housing criteria will receive extra credit in the scoring of competitive funding programs. Next slide, please. So a little about how pro housing works. It clearly defines 39 local policy types that qualify as pro housing policies. These include evidence-based measures in four categories, zoning and land use, accelerating production, reducing construction costs, and providing financial subsidies. Local communities can consider this a menu of options, choosing to adopt the ones that make the most sense for their particular community. Next slide, please. In addition to those 39 pro housing policies, the program also defines eight enhancement factors, which are additional actions that communities can take to tie their policies to state goals, including location efficiency and climate change mitigation. So altogether, pro housing establishes a total of 47 criteria, and each criterion has a point value. Next slide, please. And the local community that can receive the pro housing designation by reaching 30 points. They can reach the 30 point minimum through any combination of criteria, so long as they touch all four categories. So that means that you could, for example, um, go really deep and rack up points in one or two categories and just score, you just need to score a couple points in the other categories to uh, still get to the 30 point minimum and get the designation. Uh, this recognizes that every local community is different and different criteria will be feasible for different communities. 
The statute creating pro-housing recognized this where it required HCD to create criteria that consider the needs of rural, suburban, and urban jurisdictions and how those criteria might differ across those areas. So pro-housing is designed for flexibility, establishing a wide variety of actions a community could take to advance these goals. Next slide, please. So here's just an example of a local community that achieves the designation through its own combination of pro-housing criteria. When a city or county applies to the program, HCD will evaluate it and complete a preliminary checklist indicating which criteria are met. Reaching or exceeding the 30-point minimum means the local government is designated pro-housing. Next slide, please. So HCD is investing in helping local communities participate. We've already been engaging with dozens of local governments, conducting regional and statewide workshops, and developing instructional and other guidance documents. And this technical assistance is available to cities and counties, but it's also available to councils of government and other regional agencies um, that might have any interest in um, uh, the pro-housing program. Um, and so folks who have any questions can reach out and schedule a consultation with our team at any time by emailing us at prohousingpolicies at hcd.ca.gov. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the benefits, and I'll get into that um, right now. Competitive funding programs will provide additional points or other preferences to local governments that participate in pro-housing. So far, we know at least four such funding programs will prioritize projects that are located in pro-housing communities, and more funding programs are also following this model. This includes transportation and infrastructure funds and could be expanded to other funds in the future. Ultimately, this work is building a critical mass of benefits for local communities to meet these criteria. The long-term priority is that state agencies will require communities to receive the designation in order to get the benefits. But in this cycle and at this early stage, there could also be benefits for communities that meet some pro-housing criteria, even if they haven't received the designation yet. Next slide, please. So areas of exploration for SECP. As folks know, SECP bases its primary evaluation on how well a project meets the program's primary objective of reducing congestion in highly traveled and highly congested corridors. Although we know land use plays a major role in congestion, as we've seen, uh, it's challenging for applications to substan substantiate how specific land use policies are reducing it, unless they have clear guidance and metrics. Wherever an application is relying upon local policies thought to promote housing, the pro-housing designation can be an optional and straightforward method of substantiating it. In concept, applicants could get credit for local housing supportive policies simply by checking the yes box if they have a pro-housing designation. That would be the primary criterion. Now in the secondary criteria where we're concerned with meeting the statutory requirement to evaluate efficient land use, this concept could allow projects to use particular pro-housing criteria to demonstrate land use efficiency. Next slide, please. The SECP guidelines could achieve this by identifying certain pro-housing criteria as supportive of efficient land use, then give applicants credit for meeting any of them. Again, this concept would be limited to the secondary evaluation co-benefit of efficient land use. It would be similar to last cycle's version, except the indicators would be clearer and technical assistance would be more readily and constantly available. Here's a list of examples. These are specific pro-housing criteria. Of the 47 in the pro-housing regulation, here are just six of them as an example of criteria that promote efficient land use. 
These criteria could be reserved to a separate guidance supplement incorporated by reference, similar to what we did in the 2020 cycle. And in fact, applicants will likely find these pro-housing criteria closely resemble or even mirror the supplement indicators that we had used in SECP's last cycle. The benefits of going through pro-housing in the new cycle would be clearer expectations and guidance, technical assistance, and benefits for regional and local applicants, not only in SECP, but also in other funding programs as well. And I'd be happy to discuss those if, if folks have any questions. Um, with that, I think that wraps up my presentation and I'd be happy to help with any questions or thoughts or opinions that folks might want to share. Hi, Josh. Um, this is Kayla. We're not seeing any written comments or questions quite yet. Uh, we do have a hand raised, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Celeste so that she can go ahead and un unmute that attendee. Thanks, Kayla. Um, our first speaker is Marina Espinoza. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Marina Espinoza with the California State Association of Counties. Um, just wanted to share some of our thoughts on this. Um, as it relates to, to the uh, uh, congested corridors program, uh, we think it is uh, too soon to start linking um, the pro housing designation program um, to, to this one, um, as most jurisdictions um, haven't had an opportunity to apply for the designation yet. And um, we're also concerned uh, that the emergency regulations require direct financial subsidies of affordable housing projects in order to achieve the designation um, as and this may be difficult for um, uh, counties with limited budgets or lower tax bases um, in order to meet this requirement and um, we also have um, some concerns about how this would work for regional projects and whether all jurisdictions that are part of the project would be um, required to have achieved the designation so just wanted to share some of our thoughts on this, um, similar to some of the concerns we had with linking this to the um, local partnership program. Thank you. Yeah, it, thank you for that comment, particularly with regard to the financial subsidies. Um, we've also um, encountered a similar issue with other programs and one of the uh, one of the remedies that could be explored is, again, potentially evaluating whether the applicant has applied for pro-housing and met certain criteria, even if they haven't achieved the pro-housing designation. And so when we target those certain criteria, we could take care to avoid any that would require financial subsidy and thus relieve the low resource communities of trying to meet that burden in particular. Um, so that, that's a, a possible approach that we could take. Um, thank you for those thoughts, that's really helpful. Thanks, Josh. Uh, we, have a, we do have a couple more hands raised. Um, next up is Stephen Hanamike, I'm so sorry. It's okay, Stephen Hanamike, San Luis Obispo Council of Governments. Um, I think we share some of those same concerns as a CSAC of, of maybe, you know, not this cycle, there, there hasn't been enough time for this to, to develop. Um, but I'm wondering, so um, San Luis Obispo County is more, you know, we have a more diffuse land use pattern and some of the congestion issues are caused by a job housing imbalance. Um, so if there, if we have a highway project to uh, relieve congestion, relieve the congestion in a bottleneck, um, but the, uh, that I guess the job center is located outside the limits of that project, um, but also has pro housing sort of, uh, policies, uh, would it be, would we be able to refer to those policies, although they're outside the limits of the project itself? I mean, it would, you know, that by encouraging low infill or, or um, low income housing and infill development, uh, I think would, you know, benefit the the congestion issue um but it is you know outside of uh, of project limit and maybe this is too specific so if it is just uh, maybe we can speak afterwards yeah you know i i don't think that's too specific because that's actually a really helpful illustration of 
scenarios that uh, other folks have pointed out. And I think one approach that might be explored that I'd suggest is other transportation funding programs have used is giving credit to a community that participates in pro housing that is served by the project and that and served by the project is a fairly subjective characterization that the applicant could uh, buttress in, in their narrative. So I, I think just like the scenario that you just laid out theoretically could just be articulated in the narrative to say, you know, here's why pro housing in that jurisdiction benefits congestion reduction, um, even though the project isn't directly touching that particular community. And the idea is that the, the narrative could still would need to still be like uniquely customizable to the project that is being nominated. The pro housing program is just there to be used as an indicator for we have housing support policies in place. That's great. I think that strikes a really good balance. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thank you both. Um, next up is Rick Carter. Hi. Um, I have a couple of, of questions sort of on the practical application of this. Um, one is, how would this work where you're dealing with uh, maybe a large project that's dealing with multiple jurisdictions, multiple agencies? Um, I know we're, uh, uh, I'm with uh, PCTPA, we're contemplating a, a rail project that will go through, you know, multiple cities and multiple counties. How would that work? Also, with something like a rail project, they have no land use authority, so they are you know, uh, might be a very good project, but they're not a land use authority. There's no tie between them. That's kind of a, a second question. Um, how would you handle an applicant that's not a land, that doesn't have a land use authority? And then the other thing I'm thinking of, um, I happen to grow up in a city in Orange County that is entirely built out. Um, I'm, I, I went on Google Earth, poked around, because I said, I don't think there's any vacant lots in that city, and I can't find anything looking at an aerial. If it was something like that city, I don't know why they would go through any efforts to to get a pro-housing, um, you know, so basically certification, because all they're doing is, is, you know, occasionally replacing something. So I think that something like this could be a uh, a big barrier for a community that's built out, but they may still have transportation needs because of the traffic that's going through their community. The, the city I grew up in has a state highway through the middle of it. So I'd uh, be interested in thoughts on, on those three items. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and and I, could, I could start kind of working backwards through those. And I think those are three really important questions and really welcome um, your input and, and thoughts about uh, the appropriate answers for them as well as from other stakeholders. I think for my part, what I would suggest in the first scenario, uh, you mentioned urban areas of, of Orange County, um, every local government jurisdiction has a housing production goal. Even if it's all built out, um, the state's regional housing needs allocation process and state housing element law actually already, and this is independent of pro-housing or anything else, this is just a matter of state law that's uh, been operating for some years, it sets a specific goal for how many housing units that community has to plan for. So even if it's fully built out, they have to think about infill or densification or other methods of meeting their housing needs. So. Um, so they would still have, even independent of pro-housing, a real motivation to do the planning and adopt policies that would achieve that goal. And in fact, um, independent of the pro-housing program, the state is already stepping up efforts to enforce those statutory requirements for local communities to meet these, um, these goals. So, I, I think that's one, and the pro-housing program is really aligned with statutory and regulatory requirements already um, that those communities would have to meet. 
Um, the, the other questions, I think you raised a very important issue, which is that not all SCCP applicants are going to be counties or cities that have land use authority. And I recognize, I think we all acknowledge that that is a difficult uh, situation. Um, I think that one of the one of the models we could look to is the transit and inner city rail capital program, which has pro housing incentives for the designation or for meeting particular pro housing criteria. And it really it requires a um, a partnership of of community actors um, to work together and start really planning transit or other transportation improvements in concert with local housing goals. Um, I'll say like, you know, for our part, our department, we provide funding to housing developers and some of the criteria that we use in our scoring relates to transit service. And, you know, housing developers could say, I don't have any power over transit service, but we do want to incentivize them for working with community partners to try to develop the best project possible. Um, so, so that's, that's one of the one of the the I think responses that we would offer on that question, and I guess for that for that third and final question, or really your, your first question uh, regarding the multi jurisdictional nature of some of these projects, um, other transportation funding programs that fund inter jurisdictional projects have also encountered this question, and the approach has been that we will reward a project or prioritize a project nomination that has um, that is serving any community that participates in pro housing. So if it's a transportation improvement that goes through three jurisdictions, if one of them is participating in pro housing and uh, credibly that's relevant to the project, then the project gets credit for that, even if the other two aren't necessarily participating. And that's one of the approaches that we've taken um, to trying to you know, apply this incentive fairly and, and equitably. All right, thank you, Josh and Rick. Um, next up is Louis Zhao. Hi, this is Louis Zhao. Josh, thanks again. You've probably heard me say the same thing three times already. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's kind of in line with what the last speaker said that we as a transportation planning agency we just don't have land use authority um, so this is going to be a difficult pull for us um, but i did have a question maybe to the commission on this i know that in the application these are all scored as high medium or low or medium high or whatever but is there is there like a specific rubric that we're going to follow here on you know if an agency doesn't meet doesn't have uh, pro housing designation or their, the project doesn't support any of these things, what is it going to look like? And, and what kind of variation are we looking like in, in the scores? So I think that's something that um, I'm interested in hearing about. I don't think that's something that could be addressed here as part of this. Um, but again, Josh, thank you for taking the time to, to walk everybody through these in every single one of these workshops. No, thank you. And, and thanks for your patience. You've probably heard me say a lot of things three times now, so I appreciate it. Um, sometimes I think I'm a broken record. I, another thing that I, I guess I'll just mention, and this was probably relevant to the previous comment as well, that I should have mentioned, is that asking SECP applicants to account for local housing policies isn't new, right? We, we actually did this in the last cycle when we used housing supportive policies as indicators of efficient land use. And that, that was one of the statutory co-benefits. And we actually found that uh, applicants scored favorably, generally speaking, on that criterion. The thing that's new that we're exploring now is actually using pro housing as a more consistent and uniform rubric that applicants can actually look at and understand, okay, that's how I satisfy the co-benefit, as opposed to them just relying on their own independent judgment on how to substantiate it. So, I think we're just trying to set up goalposts that people can see. Hey, hey, Josh, I, I want to kind of 
uh, dovetail off of what you just said, since Lewis's question did um, resonate with how would CTC be working this into our process. So, and I think Josh's explanation was was perfectly on point. Um, we're planning on, so I, I know we're not presenting any draft language in the guidelines today, um, but the plan is to build on the efficient land use evaluation criteria that we already have in place in coordination with Josh and his team um, to lean towards uh, pro-housing um, focused policies, but, but we're not seeking a, an outright pro-housing designation um you know you need a pro housing designation in order to get any consideration in this evaluation criteria it will still have a spectrum um a spectrum approach and and so uh i know we're not presenting words on the page uh uh words on the page uh proposal for for your consideration today but we do plan to bring um to bring that forward at our next workshop so that we we can actually kind of close this down so just just wanted to speak to lewis's question on how ctc might be considering this and i, I see it as as building off of how it was considered um in in cycle two and thanks josh all right thank you matthew and josh uh, we do have three more hands raised um first up is uh, Paul Krupka. Thank you very much. Paul, Paul Krupka, City of Redwood City, California. Um, Josh, thanks so much. This is a, uh, a, 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 I'm, a, I'm, a I'm a passionate pro-houser as well as a transportation engineer and so forth. So I'm pleased to see these kinds of uh, ideas and actions. And then Matthew, thank you so much. You, you pointed pointed right to the question I'm going to ask, how do you see this working into the existing efficient land use co-benefit criteria? And maybe Matthew already answered that for me. I think that we're evaluating a couple different approaches that we might take. Um, one is I think if if we look at the pro housing criteria and then we look at the efficient land use supplement indicators, we'll find that they closely resemble one another and, and there's almost a mirror image in some cases. So one approach could be just swapping them, taking out the, the supplement from last cycle and putting in a, sep, a new list of the pro housing criteria and using that um, as a replacement. And the reason for that being is that you know, pro housing comes with the technical assistance and collaboration that our department can provide. But also, if you can check those boxes, you get credit under other funding programs as well, and not just SECP. So this sort of like um, gives more benefit to the applicant. That's one approach. The other thing that you know we're cognizant of is that we put out this land use efficiency supplement two years ago, and by all indications, the applicant pool started moving in that direction. So if there are local communities that have been building around meeting those indicators, you know we don't want to leave anyone in the lurch by now throwing that out and springing this new rubric on them. So the other option is actually uh, giving the applicant options, right? They could be responsive to the land use efficiency supplement with the same indicators we used last cycle or go down the path of using pro housing. That's another approach that I think um, we're exploring. I, Thank you. I wholeheartedly agree with Josh. I couldn't have said it any better. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, next up is Joanna Gubman. Hi there. Um, my name is Joanna Gubman. I'm um, Executive Director of Urban Environmentalists, and I just wanted to um, thank you for connecting uh, being pro-housing with transportation. Um, as environmentalists, we know that we need to uh, meet our climate goals by both 
building urban infill and cutting BMT. Um, you probably know the study from UC Berkeley Professor Chris Jones that found that these are more impactful local measures in urban and inner suburban areas in particular um, than even renewable energy and EVs in meeting our 2030 goals. So we're glad to see you linking um, the two. Uh, they're certainly interconnected in the form of single family sprawl. Um, and I would also add environmental justice as an interconnected issue. Um, I think it's important to have carrots to encourage jurisdictions to view these issues holistically and not to pretend that we can address congestion without addressing other aspects of land use. I also wanted to just briefly comment on the previous um, presentation. I'm not sure if there was opportunity for comments in between, but anyway, I was confused for the guidelines um, as to uh, why we are allowing any form of highway widening, um, even HOV lanes. Studies show that this doesn't help congestion and it increases BMT. That seems contrary to the purpose of the solutions for the congested corridors. And even if lanes do generate funds for BMT reductions elsewhere, that seems like an inefficient kind of governance approach um, and counterproductive to spend money increasing BMT in one place just so you can raise funds maybe to reduce the BMT elsewhere. Um, not to mention that BMT increase um, for highway widening is on the highways, um, which disproportionately emit particulates into low-income communities of color. So I just wanted to flag that as an area of concern for us. <laughs> Joanne, I will register your comment on linking pro-housing and transportation funding programs, uh, you know, and, and we appreciate that comment. And regarding your comment regarding the CAPTI, uh, Strategy 1.1 implementation into solutions for congested corridors guidelines. I know that wasn't covered under Josh's presentation. We we were in the middle of uh, workshop musical chairs. I will actually come back and afford opportunity for additional comments on that uh, on that section after Josh's presentation is completed. But Joanne, I I, I hear your comments. We've received similar comments uh, for this program in the past as well. Um, and I just I at this point I do have to just reiterates that uh, the commission is, is tasked with carrying out the Solutions for Congested Corridors program in accordance with the governing statute. And the governing statute for this program does, uh, does allow for high occupancy vehicles, managed lanes, and expansions. Um, and uh, the prohibition is on general purpose lanes. And so um, I, I, I hear you loud and clear, and, and we've gotten similar comments um in the past but at this time i i don't think the commission can can take a policy in this program through our guidelines development to uh disallow or prohibit uh on system or, or highway capacity increasing projects if they fall within what's currently allowable and and actually stated in, in statute but but we can certainly revisit that uh after josh's presentation yeah, I just just to briefly respond, I think I understand that it's mentioned as an example in the legislation, but perhaps it could nevertheless get a zero in the scoring criteria because when you technically evaluate it, you find that it in fact does not help congestion at all or something along those lines. Understood. And certainly not to prioritize it. And it looked like from the guidelines that that was a prioritized approach to those things that would generate funds to reduce the MTLs. Oh well, I can assure you, um, I can assure you that on system improvements are are not considered prioritized improvements. Um, you know, if if on system improvements, and and I'm referring on system highway improvements, so HOV or managed lane improvements uh, are those that that also perform well among each of the evaluation criteria, and and we have in this program. Uh, several across primary secondary and deliverability criteria um you know that that's how projects are evaluated but i i would actually disagree that in that a capacity increasing project on system would be considered a priority for this program and okay have, glad to hear it okay thanks 
All right, thank you, Joanna and Matthew. We have one final uh, hand raised, and that is Mike Garabid Garabidian. Uh, thank you, and good morning. Mike Garabidian, Placer County, tomorrow. Just a, a, a note, a kind of an introductory note to the idea of the authority, uh, sponsors of projects that have no land use authority, of course, they can sponsor uh, like 15 mile new freeway uh, that all the housing development of all different price ranges is dependent on. Uh, and of course, these, these authority or agency members are from the local governments that do have land use authority. So there's some connection there. But my, my question is uh, if the price of housing is included in the uh, co-benefit issue. Thank you. Uh, it, I, if, I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, and please jump in to clarify, uh, the price of housing is not directly evaluated in this co-benefit, or it, it wouldn't be. Um, the price of housing isn't directly evaluated in pro-housing. Uh, pro-housing does have policies that reduce the cost of construction. So, the idea is that these policies will make housing more readily and inexpensively available, uh, but that's really kind of the end point that pro-housing does not evaluate. And the other key thing is uh, pro-housing doesn't measure production either. All pro-housing does is it measures the policies that are in place that would be conducive to production. Ultimately, production depends on the market and pro housing doesn't hold local governments responsible for what the market does. It just looks to see that the, the right policies are in place. Does that thank you for your that that's uh very good. Thank you for your explanation. Appreciate it. Hi Josh, this is Kayla. We do have a couple of written questions that came in. Um so I'm gonna go ahead and read those to you now. The first one is from Hillary Blackerby. How many jurisdictions in California have received the pro-housing designation to date? Uh, nobody has received it yet. Um, pro-housing is a very new program. It was really just, uh, it was the program was launched and applications were invited four and a half months ago. So that was preceded by about a year and a half of development, but the actual program didn't launch until the month of July. So uh, nobody's received it yet. We have three jurisdictions that have applied and uh, several dozen that we've been corresponding with that are likely to apply in the near future. Thank you, Josh. And then the last question we have that was submitted is from Sarkis Kachek. How can we identify jurisdictions that participate in the pro-housing designation program? Pro, uh, well, jurisdictions that do get the pro-housing designation will be listed um, on our department website. Um, and then for other jurisdictions that apply um, but haven't received the designation yet, I would encourage uh, project applicants to be in touch with the local planning departments for counties and cities in your area, uh, see if they've applied and, and see what uh, criteria they've been verified to be meeting. Thank you, Josh. We do have another hand raised. I'll turn it to Celeste um, so she can unmute the attendee. Thank you. I think it's Sarkis um, wanting to comment. Hi, Josh. Um, this is Sarkis Kotrick with the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments. Uh, thanks for all your work on this. Um, given the, the recent launch of this and given that some of the transportation agencies that are going to be submitting grant applications for Cycle 3, I guess I'd have to piggyback on the concern about the timing of including this in Cycle 3 just because we're going to have to be working with Caltrans on some of our grant applications uh, very soon for submittal. And if we don't have jurisdictions that have participated or even submitted applications for this, then I, 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 I feel like it's maybe something that we look forward to the next cycle. But thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. 
Hi, Josh. Um, we do have one more question that came in. I'll read this to you now. Um, it's from Mara Toomey. Are there guidelines for the pro housing program? Yes. Um, if if folks go to the website of the California Department of Housing and Community Development, and then uh, go to the tab called, let me find it real quick so I don't misname it. Uh, I'm going to find it. Community Development. You'll find a pro housing button. Click on that. And that's a whole web page that provides the pro housing regulation and the regulation lists all 47 of those criteria that I was talking about, including the point value assigned to each one of them. And that'll provide uh, the user with the menu of options that they can look at. That same web page will also give the user access to getting in touch with our staff that provide technical assistance on pro housing. And that's available not only for cities and counties, but also for uh, any other public agencies that know that they want to partner with cities and counties uh, to participate in pro housing. We're always happy to work with them as well. Thank you, Josh. Um, we don't have any more hands raised or any more written comments or questions. So I, I think that's it from us. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate this. And um, I think this is the beginning of a very lengthy and important conversation. So um, again, thank you to the commission uh, and thank you to uh, all the stakeholders for a great conversation. Thank you, Josh, for that excellent presentation and for answering all of those questions. I do think that some of those were definitely asked before many times, so thank you for your patience and answering them just as well each time. Um, seeing as how there are no more questions or comments for Josh, uh, if you do have questions after Josh is offline, uh, feel free to send them our way or send them to the contact information that they have provided on the slide and we will be sure to reach out to Josh and get some answers for you. Or you could contact him directly as well. Either way, we're here to help you. So I think, Kayla, we can play uh, Russian roulette again with the slides, and you can go all the way back down. There we go, to Capture Strategy 1.1. And I believe Matthew had just finished his presentation here, and some folks may have questions or comments regarding this. I see Matthew laughing because- I hope we're not playing Russian roulette. Uh, <laughs> we, we both better get out of the way of that one. Um, but no, yes, we we are happy to take comments or questions now on, on CAPTI 1.1. And Josh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate you uh, making the time, especially going through the effort to, to getting logged in several different times uh, to give your presentation. And, and on that note, I will say, I've been receiving some text messages that some of our attendees have been having connectivity issues. Um, GoToWebinar must be a bit uh, glitchy today. So if any of you uh, have dropped off or felt like you missed a portion of today's workshop or any workshop uh, for that matter, we do always post the recordings of these workshops on our website so you can go back uh, and view them for, for future reference. So um, with that said, I will um, kind of bring it back to concluding um, our proposed changes uh, to the Solutions for Congested Corridors Program guidelines uh, in the Evaluation Criteria Section 16.1 um, with the changes you see in uh, bold and yellow font uh, on this slide and also provided in, in Supplement A. So uh, are there any comments or questions at this time? Um, I'd be happy to take that, or Naveen and I would be happy to take them. Um, Following this workshop, we will consider this as a, a draft uh, proposal for this uh, upcoming set of guidelines um, presented with the draft updates of the guidelines uh, at a later commission meeting. And right now we're aiming to bring draft guidelines to the June 2022 uh, commission meeting. So. Uh, Kayla or Celeste, I, I'm not seeing any. Okay, now I'm seeing some indicators go off. Thanks, Matthew. Um, 
So I'll go ahead and read the one written comment that we've gotten in so far. Uh, this is Paul, from Paul Krupka, comment on proposed change to evaluation criteria 16.1. I think this is an effective enhancement. Thank you. I'm not seeing any more hands raised or written comments quite yet. Okay. Just as a reminder to all of our attendees, we did cover CAPTI Strategy 1.1 and the changes to the evaluation criteria 16.1 uh, before Josh's presentation. There was a little bit of a hiccup. This was a later item on the agenda, but we moved it up. Um, and so now we're coming back to it. So if anybody's waiting for us to re present this, we already did present it. So I know some people, like Matthew said, may have hopped off. So just a reminder on that. Um, but if you do have questions or comments on this item after the workshop has ended, feel free to email me um, or Matthew and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions or comments afterwards as well. Here we go. We have another comment, Kayla. Would you like to reach out? Yes, thanks, Naveen. Sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> uh, let's see. So this is from Amber Crab. We strongly support aligning the SCCP guidelines with CAPTI. We request that in addition to bus and rail transit, you add ferry transit to the list of solutions that will be prioritized for funding. Ferry service provides high quality transit that can reduce VM VMT along congested corridors in a way that is comparable to rail or bus transit especially when being implemented to provide transit options for a new housing development. When looking at a corridor that includes a major bridge, new ferry transit can be implemented quicker and with fewer disruptions than adding a new rail or dedicated bus facility within a very constrained right of way, leading to near-term de decreases in VMT. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for the comment, Amber. I believe we received a similar comment in October's workshop as well, and we'll definitely add it to our list for considerations as we update the draft guidelines. Any other questions or comments? On this kind of being not seeing any more written questions or comments. Uh, I don't believe there are any more raised hands either on this topic. Awesome. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, so I think we can go ahead and move to the next slide, which is, I believe, office hours. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so I think we have been teasing program specific office hours for a couple of months now, and I'm happy to announce that the wait is over. Um, beginning February 2022, we will start scheduling appointments on a biweekly basis with agencies that would like to consult one on one with commission staff. These are private 30 minute sessions and they will allow agencies to ask us questions about the application process and program guidelines as they apply to their projects. Up to nine hours will be available in total each month and all information on how to sign up as we will release that information. Um, all information and appointments will be scheduled on a first come first serve basis, I should say first. And then go ahead and stay tuned for more information on how to sign up. Uh, we will be releasing all of that information to our stakeholders in an email, but we will also post it on the commission's website for your convenience. Uh, before I move on to the next slide, Kayla, are there any questions or comments about this slide or anything else we've covered? Hi, Naveen. We do have uh, one more question that came in, um, and I believe it's about the previous topic. So this is from Jess at Avila. How will projects be viewed and or, and or rated if a project induces VMT, but the level of proposed mitigation does not reduce VMT sustain, substantially, excuse me. I'm a little bit confused by that question. If a project induces VMT, do you mean reduces VMT, but the level is, does not reduce it substantially? Is that the right way to ask the question, Jess? Could you maybe, could we make Jess come off of mute so we can get a clarification? I, I think I understand the question. I, I believe the question is if, if a project induces VMT and makes no attempt to mitigate it. So for instance, if we have a, a sole on system improvement, uh, that will be inviting additional motor vehicle traffic uh, without offering um, active transportation or transit improvements as well, um, so that we would see just a net increase in VMT as opposed to a reduction in VMT, how will that be considered? 
Um, and, and so I would say with the, I hope that's, I hope that's the question um, clarified. And if not, feel free to either raise your hand or, or correct it in the comments box. But I can say that project would still be eligible for consideration. Um, it would be evaluated based upon each of the existing criteria or uh, draft criteria by the time we get to draft guidelines. And I can I can say that projects that induce VMT without considering alternate modes are typically um, you know, not as competitive as projects that could be either multimodal or projects that consider um, mitigation or reductions to VMT as well. And it's not necessarily because of a preference, uh, but I but that's kind of how it has played out through uh, project evaluation given the existing evaluation criteria. So I would say the, the answer is it would still be evaluated um, and could potentially be competitive if it's if the project on its own um, is successful in other evaluation criteria. Um, but it 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 would be more competitive if it were offering um, you know multiple modes of of uh, project delivery or or different approaches uh, to reducing congestion. Hi, Matthew. Jess did raise his hand, so I'll go ahead and unmute him. Okay. Yeah, I guess you should um, be able to speak. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, no, I, you misinterpreted my question. Um, okay. So uh, this induced, um, this project that induces VMT, uh, we know that it does. Um, and we're looking for measures to mitigate against that induced VMT. That is looking at, um, you know, ATP uh, type uh, scope of work that we could include in the project, uh, working with transit agencies to see how we can more efficiently um, get them on and off the state highway system, for example. Um, those um, mitigation measures, you know, at least from what we've been able to gather, wouldn't reduce the um, VMT that our project is generating. Um, it, it, it's, it's not substantial. And so um, we're making a, a, an effort to, you know, reach out, um, you know, SB 743, I think most um, agencies, it, it's new to them and they're trying to figure out how to maneuver uh, or address, uh, you know, the requirements. And so that, that's exactly what, what it is that we're trying to do. But, you know, our, find, our hard pressed to find uh, projects that would uh, uh, offset the entire induced VMT the project is generating. So that, how, how would you view a project such as that, that, you know, makes an attempt, but really there, there is at this point, at least from what we've been able to gather, uh, nothing out there that would offset, um, you know, a substantial amount of induced VMT. No, okay. I I believe I understand what you're saying, um, and I still feel like I kind of answered that when I said, you know, we don't expect that every project will have a mechanism to mitigate VMT that it might induce uh, or or in effect reduce VMT. Um, you know, it, it may not be as competitive based on each of the evaluation criteria currently in the the uh, program guidelines, though. And, and so I think because you have a specific project in mind um, and because we don't have uh, additional details at our disposal right now, and uh, I know this, this slide that we currently have up is, is not what generated this question, but I honestly think this is a, a perfect segue to um, why the commission is actually considering or will be offering um, these technical assistance uh, sessions through office hours so that we can actually, uh, program staff can sit down with potential applicants, uh, and potential sponsors. You can present an idea for a project to us and we can discuss, uh, you know, details of that project and um, whether or not it's the right fit for this program or if you have alternatives to this project or, um, you know different you know different aspects that could be requested for funding um these office hours are a perfect opportunity uh to pick our brain and we can get specific about details and these these will also be private sessions i 
not to cut Naveen off uh, on this slide, but but this this is because it's all before the call for projects. We um, you know we and we're offering this to to any potential applicant. Um, you know we we do feel uh, capable of of offering this type of feedback and and obviously commission staff. I can say this for my whole team. We're always happy to meet with uh, any stakeholder or member of the public um, if if there isn't a specific time that that works that we're currently offering. So, um, you know, I all to say I'm kind of answering I think outside of your question, but maybe we can connect uh, a bit more if this is something that that your agency or, or um, your jurisdiction has considered and you're currently deeming that it, it might not be. Uh, competitive or, or you're looking for some answers in, in which direction to go? Oh, I, I think um, you, you've addressed my question with with your answer and these um, workshops would be helpful, um, you know, to get a little bit more into detail. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe we have one more written Comment, Kayla, do you want to go ahead and read that? Yes, thanks, Naveen. Um, this is from Paul Krupka. Comment for the record, I support the comment to include ferry transit as well as bus and rail transit in the change language for 16.1. Great, thank you, Paul. We will note your comment as well. With no other comments or hands raised, Let's move on to the next slide, Kayla, please. Thank you. So the 2022 SCCP workshop schedule has been announced and workshops are scheduled until April. The official save the date flyer is linked here, literally where it says save the dates, exclamation point. Um, you can click on that and it will take you directly to the save the dates, but also we have listed out all the SCCP workshop dates here on this slide and they are also available online on the commission's website. Please remember to place holds on your calendars for the coming year so that you're able to join us for these workshops. Um, as Matthew presented earlier, we will be coming up with draft guidelines to share with you and some more, uh, some additional draft language. We will be revisiting some of the proposals that I covered earlier. Um, so there will be lots to do starting January. So hope you can all join us then. Next slide, please. So in key topics for subsequent workshops, uh, we plan to discuss CAPTA continued. Well, CAPTA will be continued. There's a lot more coming. And then there's CEQA and NEPA. We will be discussing evaluating CMCPs, integration of equity, performance metrics guidebook, project nominations, and timely use of funds. Uh, seeing no questions or comments at this time, I think we can move on to the next slide. So a little bit of a recap about what we covered today. Uh, we reviewed and engaged in a robust discussion about efficient land use and per housing criteria. Again, a big shout out and thank you to Josh Rosa who joined us and did an excellent job with his presentation and answering questions. Really appreciated that, so thank you again. Uh, we concluded the incorporation of CAPTI Strategy 1.1 and we announced 2022 SCCP office hours and workshops. Um, at this time, there are no major action items that are resulting from this meeting except uh, the office hours and the workshop scheduling that we shared just immediately just in the past. Um, but if there are any questions or comments that you have about anything we've discussed, now is a great time to ask, but you can also reach out to us after the workshop has ended through our email. We will be posting this workshop recording and this presentation on the Commission's website after the workshop, so please be on the lookout for that. I will move on to the next slide. Oh, Kayla, I think we have a question or comment. Hi, Naveen. Yes, um, I'll go ahead and unmute them, Sarkis. You should be able to Hi, speak Naveen. now. Thank you. You guys can slap my hand on this if I wasn't paying attention, but what was the um, decision on the programming years for SCCP? So thank you for bringing that back up, Sarkis. So I covered this during the program recap. This is one of two outstanding proposals that we presented on in the September and or October workshops that 
like I said, is still outstanding. And we plan to come back for a larger discussion on that particular item in the January workshop so we can discuss the timelines. Um, nothing was set yet. We have, I think what I'd covered earlier was we were between, we got consensus on the two year and four year program, but we have not um, I believe the commission is still recommending the two years, but we did receive a lot of feedback from a lot of you saying that you would be also be interested in the four-year program as well. Um, did I cover your question, Sarkis, or were you asking something else? I'm sorry if I misconstrued. No, you covered it, and then I, I, I saw Matthew come on, so now I'm, I'm like, I'm going to get my hands slapped. <laughs> but uh, no, thank you, you covered it. No, yeah, I, I, I said that you, I was going to slap your hand, but I was muted. Um, I, I'm going to take the blame for this one. Um, we, you know, in the past, we are trying to coordinate program period length across the three competitive programs. So I know that we have solutions for congested corridor program stakeholders on this workshop, um, but this is obviously an interesting um, or a topic of, of great interest in our other program workshops as well. And so uh, I believe it was Kenny, uh, Kenny Cow with MTC that made the comment in one of our prior workshops around, um, you know, with Caltrans uh, request for um, co-applicant submittals, uh, I believe by February 1st, it's important for our agency partners to understand the length of program period that we're working with. And so I understand the importance of getting this information out there as soon as possible. Um, we're, we're, I think, juggling a lot in terms of uh, what two-year versus four-year program looks like for SCCP, uh, in addition to the other two programs. And, and I can assure you that this is uh, a top priority for us to, to resolve so that we can um, broadcast the decision uh, to all our potential applicants uh, as soon as possible. So um, no, I don't expect, uh, I wouldn't expect um, an important topic not to continue coming up, which is why I'm glad Naveen covered it um, in some of a recap from last, uh, last workshop. Thanks again for bringing the back, that back up, Sarkis. Um, I believe we had another hand raised or another comment, Kayla, or maybe the hand went down. I don't know. Hi, Naveen. We did get a general question submitted that I think is important to reiterate to the group. Um, so this is from Marina Espinoza, and they asked, when do you expect draft guidelines for the program to be available? Great question, Marina. So this is another item that we covered in the September and October workshops, but it bears repeating. Uh, draft guidelines, we anticipate for those to be ready in summer of 2022 and hopefully get adopted in the commission meeting, I believe in August is what we were hoping for. So that's kind of the estimate where we are at right now. I don't have any more specificity available at this time, but I see Matthew's on, so he might have more. No, and, and, and only um, because Naveen hasn't been through the full uh, guidelines development process yet, um, we'll typically release uh, full draft uh, full draft guidelines. So this will include all um, expected and proposed changes up until a given point, uh, roughly 30 to 45 days, I believe, before uh, the commission meeting that we will be um, bringing draft guidelines before the commission. And so it, the understanding is that um, that is the point of which, you know, all workshops have, have been completed. Um, or at least all pre-planned workshops, which Naveen currently um, has workshops scheduled through April. Um, and, and so we're, because we're looking at draft guidelines at the June CTC meeting, you can accept, expect to see comprehensive uh, draft revisions, um, I, would, I would say by late April, uh, early May. And, and getting to that point, we're releasing portions of draft guidelines as we as we recommend changes. And so, um, for instance, on, on the slide with the CAPTI 1.1 proposal, um, that is a direct, uh, you know, draft proposal, uh, words on the page, you know, recommendation that will be worked into our draft guidelines. And so, um, we're, we're planning to do you know something similar with the pro housing piece uh, before the the January CTC, uh, the January congested corridors workshop 
um, and any other uh, you know specific changes to portions of the guidelines um, before we get to the comprehensive release of draft guidelines. Any other questions or comments? Thank you for that question. Hi, Naveen, no more written questions or comments and I don't see any hands raised. Alrighty, so I will move on to this slide that we are on now. Um, upcoming 2021 SCCP workshops. So as you may recall, there was a December SCCP workshop scheduled for December 16th, which has now been replaced with an all program Senate Bill 1 competitive programs workshop, where we will focus on incorporating transportation equity. The date is still the same, the time is still the same. It's Thursday, December 16th from 1 to 4 p.m. The workshop agenda will be posted on the Commission's website in the coming weeks. It will also be emailed to all stakeholders as well. The registration link is embedded in this slide for your convenience, but you can find it in the Save the Date that is posted on the Commission's website as well. Any comments or questions about this item? Okay, seeing none. Moving on, so um, before before I dive into anything else, I just want to pause. This would be a great time for anybody to ask any questions or any lingering comments or voice any concerns that you have about anything we've covered today or anything that's on your mind that you want to talk about. We do have a little bit of, we have quite a bit of time left in our uh, scheduled workshop. So feel free to bring up something that you want to talk about related to what we've discussed today. Um, so Kayla, last call for any questions or comments at this time. Hi Naveen, no written questions or comments at the moment, and I am not seeing any raised hands. Okay then. Well, for the la latest commission news and updates, you can always visit our website and follow us on social media. If you have any general comments or questions, you can always email us at ctc at catc.ca.gov. I know that's a lot of C's and A's in there, so hopefully you can get those right and, and shoot us an email. If that's too confusing for you and you have specific inquiries regard, regarding this program or SB1 programming, you may contact us individually using the information provided here for myself and for Matthew. We will do our best to respond as soon as possible. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. As always, we appreciate the constructive and informative discussion and feedback and we look forward to seeing you all at the next workshop. Before I sign off, I want to do a last, last call for any comments or questions or concerns. Hi Naveen, no questions or comments and no raised hands. Okay, well, thank you again, everybody for joining us. I hope you have a really great weekend if we don't hear from you tomorrow and an exceptionally fantastic Thanksgiving this year. Stay safe and we hope to see you on the other side. Thank you.